Hello everyone. Today I would like to show you how to sew a so-called coif, the padded head protection that is attached to your mask for Kanda Kumba. Its purpose is to add some protection against head strikes on the sides and the top of your head, also because a direct hit against the mask can be quite loud, but it also has some padding at the back to protect the back of your head. It is usually attached to your mask by hook and loop tape, where often the soft part is glued directly to the mask. But there are other options, like for example using a rubber band with pieces of the hook and loop tape sewn on, that can be attached to your mask without any glue. In this version, there is some more hook and loop tape used to fix its position in the back of the mask. Also, there was some additional padding used in this one to dampen the impact of the cane on the mask. The version I want to talk about today is an inversible blue and yellow coif that can be used in can competitions as the color of the coif indicates the side the canist is fighting on. So if you now take a closer look at it, as mentioned it has a blue and a yellow side and some protective padding between the layers. It also has some bias binding. I use a grey color as it does not create a too harsh contrast with both of the colors. Then there is the rough part of the hook and loop tape to attach it to your mask on either side. A small stripe of soft loop tape on the sides and rough hook tape on both sides of the bib. The material you need are two layers of fabric, I use simple cotton, in yellow and blue, about 80 cm wide and 60 cm high and the same size of padding. I use a thin one here, but two or three layers of it. I use two and a half meters of gray bias band. You can buy it ready made or you can fold your own. Then you need about 80 centimeters of hook and about 15 centimeters of loop tape for every side. And then some thread in matching yellow and blue, such as gray, white and black. The tools you need apart from a sewing machine are scissors for cloth and thread and I also recommend a seam ripper some measuring tools for distances and angles, like rulers or measuring tape, something to mark and draw on your cloth, I prefer a water-soluble felt pen, but the classical tailor's chalk works as well. And finally some tools to fix your fabric, like fixing pins, I prefer long ones that are used for kilting, and some clips. I use these special ones that I bought at a fair, but small cloth packs should work as well. This is the pattern that you can find in the video description. If necessary, adjust it to the size of your mask, but keep in mind that the finished coif will be slightly smaller than the pattern. Print it out twice and stick the pieces together along the long end to duplicate it. Then place the pattern on your fabric along the grain, so along the direction of the fabric thread. Flatten the pattern and fix it to the fabric with your pins. Then take your marker and draw along the outline of the pattern onto your fabric. Note that I have chosen the yellow fabric as it is easier to see the markings. If you use fabric with the right and wrong side, take care that you mark on the right side as you will not overturn it after sewing. Remove the pattern and determine the middle point of your baseline and the bib. Draw a line through these points and extend it over the pattern boundary in both directions. I now start to draw my complete sewing pattern onto the fabric. I chose a pattern with vertical lines in 10 cm intervals and diagonal stripes with a distance of 7 cm and 45 degrees upwards from the middle line. For assembling the parts, you now flatten your second fabric with the wrong side up and you then add the layers of padding and flatten them carefully. Now 
At last, put your marked fabric on top with the right side up. As this quaff will be for Thomas, and he has asked me to include some extra padding in the target area, I add another stripe of padding in this position. Now, as I want to start sewing along the middle line, I start to pin left and right along this line, while I leave enough space that the sewing foot can pass in between. Before I start sewing, I check from both sides, the blue and the yellow, that there are no folds between the pins. I then continue at the sewing machine, where I use a yellow upper thread and a blue lower thread and a stitch length between 2 and 3. I then sew along the middle line. Be careful not to apply any force and push the fabric in any direction while sewing, but only lightly guide the fabric with your hands to make sure the sewing foot does not deviate from your markings. Before removing the pins, check that the seam is even and you did not generate any folds while sewing. Then move on to the second line. Always make sure that you flatten your fabric layers from both sides every time before pinning and sewing, as this is absolutely crucial for obtaining an even result. Also, always check from both sides if there are no irregularities before and after every pinning and sewing step. If you realize that after sewing, either the seam is crooked or there are folds in the section between the newest seam and the last, Resolve the seam with the seam ripper and redo the seam. Finished with the vertical seams, I now start with the diagonal lines of the pattern. Other than with the vertical lines, the diagonal lines begin at the middle line, so inside the pattern rather than outside, so you need to perform a fixing stitch. For that you begin sewing from the starting position, but after a few stitches you push the reverse lure and sew backwards a few stitches, before you continue forwards. The diagonal seams will reveal how accurate you have worked on the vertical lines. So-called noses can also appear from pulling or pushing the fabric at the sewing machine. If the noses are only small and at the positions where the seams cross, they can sometimes be gently rubbed away. For any remaining visible noses, it is your choice if you can accept them or if you want to redo the seams. Once the pattern is finished, you can start cutting along the outlines of the quaff. For the final length of the incisions and the bib, you can hold the quaff to your mask before you cut at these positions.
By folding along the middle line, you can check if you have cut symmetrically. At the cut surface, you can now nicely see the two layers of fabric and the layers of padding in between. You can cast the rim with a zigzag stitch before proceeding to the next step. To see the rim, I use grey bias binding or bias tape that I will attach to the cloth along the rim. The bias tape is simply a stripe of cloth that is folded twice. If you cannot or do not want to buy it ready made, you can make it yourself and there are different tools available that can help you do that. For example this one, where you put a pre-cut stripe in and it is folded when it comes out on the other side. There are different ways of how you can attach the bias tape and the best way is probably to unfold it and sew it on from one side close to the fold, then fold the tape around the other side and either sew it on with a blind stitch by hand, if you want to have an invisible seam, or with the machine. I use a quick and dirty approach but it is a bit fiddly. I use clips to fix the tape into the right position and then just sew it on directly. You have to be careful that the amount of bias tape on each side is about the same while you have to bear in mind that the rim itself is quite thick. I keep that in check by making sure that the tape pokes out of the clip about the same amount on both sides. Also, you have to take care that the tape really encloses the rim fully and that you do not leave any empty space between the tape. I also recommend that you keep the distance between the clips quite small so that the tape cannot slip out of place. When I have fixed the first part of the tape, I start sewing it on with a grey thread. I remove the clips only shortly before the sewing foot, while I keep holding the tape in position with my finger so that it cannot slip. This way, I can also feel whether the rim is still in between or if the tape feels empty. Every time I reach the end of the clips, I stop the sewing machine with the needle down to continue attaching the clips. The edges can be a bit tricky. I first attach the tape to both sides of the edge and then fold over the residual tape at the edge so that a fold appears at an angle of 45 degrees. I add some stability by sewing along the created fold. For that I sew right until the beginning of the fold and then, while the needle is down, I lift the sewing foot and turn the quaff so I can add a few stitches to the fold. I do this by lowering the foot, sewing a few forward stitches, then a few backward stitches until I end up where I have started. Again with the needle down, I lift the foot, turn the piece and continue sewing along the rim. You can use the foot lifting also at other positions where the turns get quite sharp, but always remember to have the needle down if you do. If you reach the position of the incision, 
make sure that you really push the tape down into the edge. Once you've reached the end, cut your tape but leave a few centimeters. You then fold the tape to the inside so that there is no cut fabric exposed and fix it using the forward-backward-forward stitching technique. Check from both sides if the tape is attached well. As I've mentioned before, this is the quick and dirty approach, so you will most likely find gaps on the other side of the quaff, where the seam did not catch all of the tape. I then go over those spots again from the other side, as I do not mind the overlaying seams. If that looks too messy for you, the proper approach, where you first attach the tape to one side, will be better for you than the quick and dirty one. What is now left to do is attaching the hook and loop tape. I use sticky tape here, but only because it was the only one that I could get in the shop. It has the advantage that you do not have to fix it with pins, but I do not really recommend it, as depending on the glue, it can mess up your tools and sewing machine pretty badly. I have picked black tape for the blue side and white tape for the yellow side, because the contrast between the colors is not too drastic. I cut a stripe of about 3.5 cm in width for the long side and stick or pin it on right behind the bias tape.
For the side pieces, I cut strips of 1 cm of the soft loop tape and fix them. Especially if you work with pins, you should only fix the tape on one side of the quaff and sew it on first before you attach the tape on the other side. For sewing it on, I use a black upper thread and a white lower thread as I start with the darker side of my quaff. I begin and finish the seam again with fixing stitches, as done before. Sewing through the plastic of the tape can be quite tough for your machine, so sew slowly and, if necessary, guide the needle by turning the stitching wheel at the side of your sewing machine with your hand, stitch by stitch. On the back side, you can now nicely see where you have to attach the white loop tape. Fix it right above the seam and sew it on from the yellow side. Remember to reverse the upper and lower thread at your machine. To find the positions for the hook tape at the bib, again hold your quaff against your mask and mark the position for the tape at one side. Mirror the position on the bib for the second piece of tape. Cut about 1 cm wide pieces of your hook tape and pin them onto the bib. To have more flexibility, you can also decide to attach a wider strip to the bib. If you do, you might want to switch the position of the hook and the loop parts of your tape, as the hook part easily gets entangled in your hair. Again after sewing it onto one side, attach the tape in the same position along the seam at the back side. The last thing to do is to remove all loose thread with your seam ripper or small scissors. And there you go, that's your turnable competition quaff. Please let us know if you have questions or comments.